Thank you for that warm introduction, Kaylee. Uh, it was really wonderful to chat with you and Sonia and to meet all of your colleagues. Um, thank you so much for having me here at Stanford. Like, I'm super happy to be here. So my best friend from college, Luke Stewart, was an MBA student here, and he's always like, go Cardinals all the time. So I actually have a, a Stanford hat at home from when Stanford played Berkeley circa 2013 and just completely routed Berkeley. And I love to wear that straw hat. It's kind of cool, but I thought, okay, let me contain myself and not bring my Stanford hat in. <laughs> but it's, it's really, it's wonderful to be here. I've, I've had a great set of meetings so far, and I, I look forward to presenting this paper on why don't Ely colleges expand supply. And this is joint work with Kent Smetters, who is at Wharton. Stanford will be prominently featured throughout this, so it's very fitting for Stanford to be, I think, maybe the second place that I'm presenting this work. So let me start off by... Let's make sure that this clicker is working. Okay. Let me start off first by telling you a little bit about the research. So broadly speaking, I'm very interested in questions around student opportunity and access and thinking about how educational institutions in concert with neighborhoods and families can help to reduce some of these inequality. And so when I think about my approach to education, I'm interested in traditional credentials like a college degree, but also very interested in non-traditional credentials such as occupational licenses. And so I have some work with one of my students where we show that occupational licensing reduces racial and gender wage gaps. Um, I have other work that looks at the effect of unilateral divorce laws on uh, women's educational attainment, and other work too that looks at the effects of neighborhood tipping on residential segregation, which Kaylee alluded to in her very warm introduction. And today's talk is gonna be on the role of prestige as an explanation for why elite colleges like Stanford and like Harvard don't expand. Um, but before jumping into the work, I want to tell you that most of my work is done very collaboratively. So in concert with my students, in addition to faculty colleagues at several universities. Let me just show you a picture of some of the students that I work with. And I say this because as a faculty member, like one of my great joys is being able to work with students. And I want to say to all the students in the audience, like don't be afraid to engage faculty because one of the great amenities of being faculty is we get to work with really bright students. And so this is a picture of like, my research group, and, and with each of these students, like I have a paper with that we've written collaboratively together. And it's been a learning process and a training process for them, but it's also been a learning process for me as a mentor as well too. And, and I wanna echo the advice that I gave to Kaylee, which is make sure that you live as a whole person while in graduate school too. And as I go through the talk, I'll talk about the substance of what the research is, and I'll also try to tease out specifically for the graduate students some aspects of the research process that will demystify like how we got to this paper so that way you don't just see like a polished paper being presented and you're like oh my god like every paper that faculty write just comes just comes out like perfect the first time so i'll, I'll try to, to add some of those tidbits the other thing that i want to say is econ seminar rules so feel free to ask questions at any time and to interrupt i think we go until five o'clock right so it's my job to monitor the time so you ask as many questions as you want to ask all right so this figure here just plots U.S. undergraduate enrollment over time. So on the horizontal axis, what we have is the years going from 1960 to about 2010. And on the vertical axis is the number of college students in thousands. And so you can see over this time period, the number of folks going to college in the U.S. has increased by about four times. And when we look at applications, so this figure plots applications from about 2000 to 2010. And it looks at the growth in applications over that time across institutions, depending on the quality of those institutions. And the way that we're going to think about quality is what's the SAT scores of students who are matriculating to that school. There are a lot of other ways that you can think about quality, but this is just one of them. So what we can see is we have Harvard, Princeton, and, St Harvard, Princeton, Stanford, and Yale, which are the four schools that are typically jostling for the number one position. So Stanford is certainly represented there. Then we have the top 2% of those schools in red. And then we have the, the, we have the top half in yellow. And what you can see is basically over time, like schools, regardless of their quality, have experienced the same growth rate in terms of the number of people that are applying to those schools over time. So that has happened. Now, in this next figure, we're looking at the same schools broken out by the SAT um, distribution, but we're looking at how many spaces have existed at these schools, and we're looking at that growth. And so one of the things that's really striking is even though in terms of the applications, the growth in applications looks very similar, when we look at the growth in slots, this is Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and Stanford. It's barely moved. It's increased by less than 10% 
even though applications has increased tremendously over that time period. And in a sense, you almost get this inverse relationship between quality and the provision of slots. And so the provision of slots has actually been growing most slowly at presumably the highest quality institutions. I love that you asked that question, right? So, so Sean's question is incredibly important because what you can imagine is happening is it's not just that more people are applying to schools. It could be the case that what you have is actually an individual person is applying to a lot more schools too. And in the paper, we call this a knock-on effect. So, so there are kind of like two things that are going on here. In a sense, this knock-on effect is endogenous, meaning that if, if, if Stanford decides not to expand, then the admissions rate at Stanford is going to be a lot smaller as more folks start to apply to Stanford. Now, because Stanford is more, so is, it has a low admissions rate, students have to diversify and they have to apply to more schools too. Right? And so in a sense, by restricting supply, endogenously what that's going to do is it's going to lead to this increased competition and this increased application of like, this, this increase in the number of applicants. What I'm going to do at the coming towards the second half of the talk when we do our model simulation is we're going to really try to, to capture those dynamics to see how much of this is driven by strategic, strategic behavior too. But we actually think that's a mechanism in this context. So thank you for that question. And so you can see that the less elite schools have increased a lot, but the very elite schools have not increased very much. And so this is going to be, in a sense, the, the, the puzzle that we're going to be trying to get at. Here, what we do is we plot for the Ivy League schools the admissions rates over time. And so I'm going to pick on the University of Pennsylvania where I, I did my PhD. So if you look in the mid-1990s, the admissions rate at Penn was about 40 to 50 percent. That's this red line here. And over time, there's been this dramatic race to the bottom that's been highlighted in the popular press, right? So elite universities have become incredibly difficult to get into. You have this falling admissions rate. And we want to try to understand, like, what are some of the factors that have been driving that, too? Because in a sense, this is symptomatic of the lack of expansion as well, too. And it feeds into the point that, that the question that Sean raised. And it's not just that elite um, Ivy League schools. Even if you look at what are called the Ivy Plus schools, so this is like your Caltech, your Duke, your MIT, your Northwestern, you see, this, you see a very similar pattern of falling admissions rates. And the University of Chicago is especially very interesting, because if you look around 1998, Applications to the University of Chicago was over 50%. So it was basically like a coin flip in the mid-1990s to get into the University of Chicago. And now, the University of Chicago is like as competitive to get into as, say, like Brown or Penn. Right? And so clearly, universities are making decisions around um, the admissions rates. And this is something that they care about. And we want to write down a model that helps us to understand what could be driving um, these responses across the elite universities, but that doesn't seem to be happening at um, less selective universities. So for a lot of the paper, we're going to focus on Harvard, Princeton, Stanford, and Yale. And this is just because these are the schools that have typically been ranked number one. But you can think about this analysis as being generalizable to a whole host of other schools. And so I'll talk about the extent to which schools care about prestige. And you can think about that as being analogous to, in a sense, like, you can think about that as being like isomorphic to what we were seeing about these rankings of like the schools by the SAT um, qualifications of those students. So you can think about it from that perspective. You can think about it from the perspective of how selective they are to get into. Um, but we're going to focus on Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and Stanford for the empirical part of the exercise. But for the theoretical part of the exercise, it can apply to elite as well as non-elite universities. Okay. Um, so this is a quote from the New York Times that basically describes like the current state of admissions. And so let me just read it. Deluged by more applications than ever, the most selective colleges are invariably rejecting a vast majority, including legions of students they once would have accepted. Admissions directors at these institutions say that the most students, say that most of the students they turn down are such strong candidates that they are indistinguishable from those who get in. Right? And this is, in a sense, going to preview what we're going to talk about later on the end of the paper in terms of what's the, what's the welfare loss to society when you have all of these incredibly qualified students who otherwise are capable and qualified to get into these elites, capable and qualified to have gotten into these elite schools in the past, but they're not getting in, in part because the schools have not been expanding. And the Washington Post has analogized this to, like, college admissions being a type of like hunger games, right? <laughs> like literally like the language that's describing this is pretty stark. So when we think about these institutions, so what, what we've shown you is that 
the number of spaces is actually not increased by a lot. And if you look at the number of students that have been offered admissions, that number has actually declined across these very elite schools. And a part of this is because these schools have become a lot better at managing what's called yield. And so yield is what's the likelihood of you going to a school given that you've gotten admitted. And one of the ways that elite schools have been able to manage yield is through offering admissions to more early action or early decision candidates, effectively like taking away that choice. And so about half of the students that are admitted, for example, to Harvard College are admitted through the early action program there. And that's similar at the University of Pennsylvania and others, right? And so although you see an admissions rate of about 6% or 5% for Harvard, when you look at the early action pool, that admissions rate is closer to 12%. And so the admissions rate for the regular decision pool is going to be a lot closer to like 3% or even like lower than that. And so in a sense, it's like what's happening here is potentially even starker than, than we think. Now, let's kind of step back and think about what were these institutions doing historically. And the, the talk is going to be front-loaded with a lot of consideration and care given to what are some potential alternative explanations for why schools, elite schools have not been expanding. And one of the reasons why we do that is because we want to really take very seriously a whole host of potential explanations before going down the road of saying that prestige is an important component of the discussion. So before the 1990s, what's interesting is that overall, the number of the number of full-time enrolled students has increased by almost double across the United States. And even some of these, um, and during, that, during, during the most recent 45-year period, Stanford and Yale and these other schools um, have increased just by very little, right? But before that period, they increased tremendously. So in fact, we have the, the longest time series for Yale going back to the, 1970, to the 1700s, rather. And you can see that from the early 1700s to about the mid-1970s, Yale increased by about 2% per annum, right? And so what are going to be some of our key questions? So the first key question is going to be, why has enrollment increased only slightly at elite colleges while climbing substantially at these non-elite colleges? So that's the, the figure that I showed you um, earlier. And then also, what are some of the welfare consequences of these plummeting admissions rates at elite universities as these very qualified group of students who otherwise would have been let in in times past are not being granted access to these institutions? And then also, like, we're going to try to quantify like, how large these losses are as well, too. <clears throat> So let me highlight some of the, the key findings of the paper. So this is just a preview. I haven't shown you any models yet, but sometimes you, you don't get to the point where you can show models, so you want to preview the results. So the headline is going to be, we're going to have a model where colleges are going to value what we're notionally going to call like profits, and they're also going to value prestige. And the way that we're going to capture prestige is by looking at what's the admissions rate of that college relative to its peers. And we're also going to look at it in terms of what's the student body quality relative to the student body quality of its peer institutions. So for example, we're going to think about like Harvard benchmarking relative to Princeton, Stanford, and Yale, and vice versa. And one of the headline results is we're going to generate a comparative static from our model in which when there's an increase in demand for these institutions, more students are applying, more students want to get into these colleges, that schools that place a lot of weight on prestige above some threshold value, those schools are going to respond by decreasing their admissions rates. And so you see, for example, with like the University of Chicago, the University of Penn, where like it was increasing for a while and then like you have like that decrease. And the schools that place weight on prestige that's going to be below that threshold value, so they don't care as much about about prestige, those schools in the face of increasing demand are actually going to increase their admissions rates. So that's going to be one of like the headline theoretical comparative statics that's going to let us see that we can replicate some of the time series patterns in the data with a model that takes into account um, prestige. So that's the first piece. The second point, when we start to think about the, this game that schools are going to be playing, this is going to be socially inefficient. And here's the reason why. Schools are going to effectively be playing the equivalent of like a prisoner's dilemma game in which Stanford would disarm or Stanford would expand supply if Harvard agreed to do that as well too. And so in the, in a, the inability of schools to actually, to actually coordinate on, 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 on this policy is going to lead to a situation in which each of the schools are going to undersupply spaces, right? And so that's going to be um, one, of the, one of the consequences. And in fact, it's going to turn out that allowing schools to coordinate or to collude in this context could be potentially um, socially more efficient. And so th those are going to be some of our, 
our key findings. So let me start off by defining prestige. And so when we think about prestige, notionally we're going to be thinking about prestige as measuring a relative quantity. So we're going to be thinking about what's the admissions rate of Harvard relative to its peer institutions. It's not just the absolute quantity that the university is going to care about. It's really how much do I have relative to the folks in my peer group. And that's going to be a very important distinction here. And so one of the reasons why institutions might value prestige is it could boost alumni contributions. Alumni might care a lot about the institution being the number one institution. Um, in addition to that, it could also be really important for bringing external grants from private or institutions to the university. Like if my university is perceived as being very prestigious, then in a sense, if it's difficult to discern like other things about universities, there could be some rents that are going to accrue to that. Um, students may value the prestige inherently as well. It could be a boost to faculty. Faculty may be like, I'm a faculty here at Northwestern. And feel better about themselves because of that. Right? And it could also be a compensating differential for staff. Right? Some people can say, gee, I'm working at Stanford. Like, that's worth about $10,000 to me. And Stanford can say, yeah, that's right. We can pay you $10,000 less. <laughs> this happens. This happens. <laughs> Maybe not at Stanford. Um, yeah, this, this was a pretty like, funny quote from the New York Times that kind of captures like, the extent to which like, this has really become like, something that's very salient in the culture. And so, so Frank Bruni, who's a columnist at the New York Times, writes, cementing its standing as the most selective institution of higher education in the country, Stanford University, sorry to pick on Stanford, this is the New York Times, this isn't Peter Blair, uh, announced this week that it has once again received a record-setting number of applications. So you get this increase in applications. And that its acceptance rate, which has dropped to a previously uncharted low of 5% last year, plummeted, to an all the, plummeted all the way to its inevitable conclusion of 0%. With no one admitted to the class of 2020, Stanford is assured that no other college can match its desirability in the near future. <laughs> And so that kind of goes back to the future where you see like just this rapid descent, right? And so th this market is really interesting because in a lot of contexts where there's an increase in demand for a particular object, you typically see like an increase in supply for these objects, right? Equilib the equilibrium quantity tends to increase, but not in, in this market. So let me give you an outline of, let me give you an outline of the talk. So I'll give you a brief literature review. Then I'll go through some seemingly um, obvious competing explanations here because we want to treat very seriously that there could be other things going on that could explain why elite universities are not um, expanding. And then we'll talk about the base model where we look at universities as maximizing utility, which is some weighted function of their profits and the prestige, which we're going to capture as their admissions rate relative to that of their peers in this base model. And then after that, we're going to do an enhanced model that's going to get to the question that Sean raised, which is that in a sense, as students start to apply to, as these institutions become more selective, the likelihood of students getting in reduces, and so students in equilibrium may want to apply to more institutions to assure themselves of getting in somewhere. And so we're going to really capture that and try to see, like, how does, how does the presence of prestige affect application behavior and matriculation behavior? So we're going to have something very concrete to say about exactly this question of strategic applications, um, Sean. And after we provide the enhanced model, then we'll provide some evidence from the simulation that's going to speak to um, how these decisions are changing over time. And then in addition to that, what are some of the welfare um, consequences of that? Um, I'm going to hop into the literature review, but are there any questions so far? Please. What would, be, what would be an example? So, like, let's, so walk me through like an example of a bureaucratic efficiency that exists that, that you have a, a strong prior that might, reduce, um, that might be reduced through competition. Yeah, I mean, any number of sort of you know, bureaucratic little you know, foxholes within a university where there's asymmetric information about what's that office doing again? Yeah. They have a budget, they have resources, no one's quite sure. It's almost like a classical scanning type of bureaucracy where there's a provider Mm -hmm. who doesn't really understand the cost structure of what that office does, 
Yeah. So that office can maximize its budget and its own local prestige by seeking resources and expenditures beyond where marginal benefit equals marginal cost. So you can think about that as one of, in, in, in the motivation slide, we talked about one of the reasons why institutions might care about prestige, and it could be that in the presence of asymmetric information, like this makes it really easy for firms to, to kind of like outsource the sorting, the screening to, to firms. So say, for example, um, and I've heard this story for like a lot of like really top management consulting firms where they would say, we're charging $300 you know, an hour, and, and we have to put like a Stanford or a Wharton or a Harvard MB in front of these folks, right? Because in a sense, that's a shorthand to them of telling them that this person has a high quality. Now, the, the question that you're after, which is that can competition reduce bureaucracy? Competition among institutions have these positive benefits. That's, but that, that's totally a potential, like that's on the table. In some sense, it's out of the scope of like what we're trying to answer in this paper, because we're really trying to focus on the, what's unique about this market, which is that we've seen an increase in demand for, for, for slots here, but we've seen an increase in demand across the entire quality spectrum. Like remember that first graph. But non-elite schools are responding by actually increasing supply, but elite schools are responding by not increasing supply. So there's something that's unique about elite schools with respect to like supply. And we're trying to get at what are some mechanisms to, to, to pin that down. And so we're going to look at some of these competing explanations. Yes? So I confess I'm going to have some beef very soon after we answer this question, and it won't be because of my response here. So but what if I answer the question really well? Can we negotiate? Maybe you stay. I appreciate that question. Maybe like a, um, a cheesy answer to that is I work at a university and if I said that, I don't know if I would have a job. <laughs> no, I mean, that, that, no. Let, let, me, let me set that aside for the moment. Um, the way that we come at this is we really try to situate ourselves within the, you're absolutely right that there's a lot of literature in sociology, for example, that looks at positional goods. And so you can think about like institutions like a Stanford or Harvard, it's a brand that people want access to. Right? Like folks will come in and they'll take selfies with, I've had people take selfies with me on the Harvard campus because they're like, oh, you're a professor at Harvard, let me take a picture with you. And I'm like, I don't know that anything's going to rub off on you if you take a picture with me, but it's cool. Um, so so there, there is that long tradition. And so one way that you can think about the exercise that we're doing is we're really providing a framework to give empirical content to this within the context of, of economics. So when you look at the literature review, a lot of the work <laughs> on higher education is focused a lot on the demand side and like really thinking about the fact that students over time, thinking about the fact that students over time have actually changed their preferences for not going to the local school but being willing to travel a lot more. And in a sense, we've taken the supply constraint as being fixed. And so if you look at a lot of the empirical literature, it would basically say, we assume that supply is fixed. How are students making their decisions? And in a sense, what it's saying is that Universities are not consciously making the decision about like whether to expand or not, but universities are making tons of other decisions too, right? And so we see this as we see this as a very important gap in the literature that we want to fill by saying that supply is endogenous. Universities are choosing how big to be, and what are the factors that are entering into that? And so, in some sense, we're like we're helping economics to engage with this literature that exists in other fields by thinking about how prestige, could, how prestige could be an explanation for why elite schools are not expanding. And in that sense, they're really unique relative to a lot of other schools in the quality distribution. So thank you for your question. Does that answer your? OK, perfect. Yeah, so like, and, and this dovetails with the, with the question. Yeah, it's a good question. So like, 
so in a sense, like the approach that we're taking is going to be very empirical. And what we're going to say is that people have a willingness to pay for higher education at a given institution. And that willingness to pay is going to take into account the presence of substitutes, right? So for example, like if there were like 10 Harvards, like my willingness to pay for Harvard, and the, pay, the paying for Harvard could be going through like a grueling application process, like starting like an orphanage in Tanzania where I cure cancer and like dig 70 wells, right? Like my willingness to pay would be like very different if there were like 10 Harvards. Right? And so in a sense, like the demand curves that we're going to have here in, in this paper are going to capture the presence of those substitutes. Right? And so you really can think about the, you can think about the prestige that weight loss that we're going to get here as capturing the presence of those substitutes. Right? So this is a completely revealed preference like, approach to it. Like this is how much people are willing to pay. We're under providing slots at these schools. You know, the, ergo, like here's the, the welfare loss relative to that. Uh, there, there is some exception. So there is this Apple paper where they look at um, supply being endogenous. And there are a couple of differences relative to the Apple paper. So one is that we're going to look at prestige as being a relative term, whereas in the Apple paper they're going to think about student quality in absolute terms, like what's the average quality of the students at that institution. And so that's going to be one really important, um, one really important difference. And because we're looking at this relative quality, in a sense, you can have a situation where all of the schools coordinate on expanding, and it doesn't change the relative ranking of the schools, but it changes the absolute number of slots, right? And so this relative comparison is going to be really important. The second thing that's going to be an innovation in our paper as well, too, is that we're going to provide a very simple, tractable, analytically tractable framework for this type of analysis, and there's actually going to be strategic interaction between the institutions as well, too. So that's another contribution that we're going to be making in, in this space. All right. So let me skip over that for a moment. All right. And this also relates to this literature on positional goods. Uh, uh, f this is like the conspicuous consumption paper by Kerwin, Charles, and co-authors. Uh, and I'll skip this for a moment, just in the interest of time. Let me go through some seemingly obvious competing explanations that could potentially explain this. So the first thing is like cost, right? So you might say, well, oh, you know, like there are just some fixed costs to expanding. For example, like land is a very big one, right? But, but the irony here is that like most institutions are building. Like you walk across the Stanford campus and it's like there's like building stuff happening everywhere. And places like Stanford and like Duke are a lot less land constrained. Even places like Columbia, they're building upwards, right? Cornell recently started um, Cornell Tech in the, in the heart of the city, right? And so it's not clear that, you know, land is going to be the limiting resource in this context here, right? Now you might think that, there, that, that's, that's an, that it's an increase in the variable cost that's really driving this reason for why elite colleges aren't expanding. So, so it could just be that the marginal cost is just increasing a ton um, over time. Uh, there, there are a couple of reasons to believe that this may not be the case. So one is that you've seen the adjunctification of, the prof the, of, of professors, where you have a lot more adjunct professors like teaching um, students relative to research professors, and that's across the board. Uh, you had Hurricane Katrina as a type of natural experiment. When Hurricane Katrina struck, a lot of students that were displaced from, uh, from institutions in, in Louisiana, they actually were relocated to a lot of elite schools like Duke and Brown, I think, accepted 100 students, right? And so we think about like, this variable cost or the marginal cost of adding another student. Like, it can't be that high if you're able to accommodate people who are displaced in the short run, too. There's, there's some slack that's going to be there. Another thing you might think of is like, what schools want to do is they want to maintain the quality of students. And so what's happening is they're not expanding because we don't have like, quality students. Something that flies in the face of that is if you just look at the SAT percentiles, what you would see is that this is the 25th percentile for math for Harvard, Princeton, and Stanford. Like, these are above like 1,300. And if you go to the 75th percentile, we're almost topping out at 1,600, right? And so in a sense, like, these schools are saturating the quality, the quality bounds. And moreover, we've had a, a, an increase in the, the amount of students that are eligible for these institutions. So you have women entering um, elite universities, you have minorities, you have the internationalization of higher education as well. And so in a sense, like the stock of potentially qualified people to enter these institutions has just dramatically increased. Not to mention just the natural population increase. Right? <clears throat> and if we wanted to just maintain um, student quality, like we would have actually seen a doubling of enrollment even at places like Stanford and, and Yale. So, bum, bum, bum. Another 
possible reason could be like just maintaining research quality. So maybe institutions don't want to expand because they want to maintain the research quality. But if you look at both the quantity, so this dashed line here is the increase in the US population. This blue line is the increase in um, college enrollment. And this is the increase in doctoral people with PhDs. So if you think about p folks with PhDs as supplying the, the necessary um, human capital to become faculty members, that's been increasing in step with the number of with the college enrollment too. So like the actual staff to staff universities has been increasing in lockstep with demand, right? So that doesn't seem to be like a limiting um, explanation. And even the quality, so that's the quantity side. Even when we look at the quantity, like median uh, GMAT scores are up, GRE scores are up, verbal and so on and so forth. And so in a sense, it's like not just the quantity is there, but also the quality is there as well too. Okay. The other explanation that typically is used is that this, this kind of look and feel argument. Like, you know, Stanford really feels like Stanford if it has, you know, like 8,000 students. Like, anything more than that, and it just doesn't feel right. In a sense, it's kind of like, it's hard to, to say, like, well, what's the theory behind why that is the case? That's the first one. The second thing is that there are a lot of things that are changing the look and feel of, of, of universities, right? You have lots of new buildings that are a lot more modern. In a sense, there are a lot more amenities that are available to students. So like the Stanford of today is fundamentally different from the Stanford that your parents um, inherited. And moreover, like even before this like modern rankings era, like you had a lot of elite schools that were expanding quite rapidly. Like Stanford, I think, increased by about 80% between um, 1940 to 1980. So then the question is, well, why did it stop expanding? Right, so that's kind of a historical argument. And one of the things that we're going to highlight really is the introduction of this US News and World Report that's going to start providing information about the quality of schools, that's going to start ranking schools, that's going to make this information a lot more accessible as being one of the catalysts for schools caring a lot about prestige. So like go back to those figures that I showed you with the declining admissions rates. And you'll see like even in the, the early 1990s, like some schools, like very nice elite schools, had like the probability of getting and was close to being a coin flip. But over time that just like went, is, is, is trending down towards zero. All right. And this is just some historical evidence. So if you look at Princeton, Princeton grew about 40% from 1950 to 1980. Stanford about 38% from 1950 to 1980. And so there was a time period when, in a sense, like the most prestigious schools were actually the biggest schools. So like in the early part of the 1900s, Harvard and Yale were actually competing over which school could be the biggest. And that was its measure of like which one was the most influential or the most prestigious. But that has changed. And in a sense, like our paper is going to get to that. Okay. And the last thing that I want to say is if we want to think about this look and feel argument, so what we do in this figure is we look at all of the schools that were the same size as Harvard in 1990. And then we look at how those schools have increased in terms of their size over time. And we sort that by where they are in the SAT distribution. So if it really was this look and feel argument, then the schools that were as big as Harvard in the 1990s should have said, we just feel like this is the right size and we're, we're going to grow. We're not going to grow a lot too. And they're going to follow the same like, growth trajectory as Harvard. But what you see is that it's really the elite schools that have not expanded, but all of these other schools have expanded too, even though they looked the same as Harvard in terms of size in the early 1990s. Right? And so it doesn't seem like this look and feel argument is really what's, what's driving it. So let me now go to the simple model where we're going to talk about what's the role of prestige in terms of potentially explaining some of the, the data that we see. Before I get there, are there any questions? All right, please. Can you speak up a little bit for me, please? Oh, I see. So, so your argument would be like, in a sense, like these schools exist for like the very wealthy over. over that. And in a sense, like that pot of like super rich kids who are also qualified is fixed. Yeah. So that could be an explanation. So then like, so let, let, let's, let's think about that. So in a sense, 
you would expect, let's say you have a normal distribution and we're looking at people that are like two or three sigma folks, right? And so as the population increases, let's say that the number of oligarchs is going to increase in step with the population, right? That's one reason to see like a natural increase in terms of like this pool of folks, right? Then you layer on top of that the introduction of women like joining a school like Princeton in the 1960s. Like these oligarchs are going to ostensibly have both sons and daughters. And so that's going to effectively like double like the, the population of like the kids of oligarchs who can get in. And then you have like minorities coming in and then you have the internationalization of U.S. higher education too. And, and like these factors together are all going to be pushing us towards having like a larger potential like applicant pool of folks who fit into this kind of like oligarch framework as well too, right? And even there, right? And, 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 and the other part too that I think is really interesting is let's say for example like what we're trying to do is find the next Mark Zuckerberg. We're really trying to sample the tail of like some productivity distribution. Now if we have really great screening technology and we could really say this guy is going to be Mark Zuckerberg, this, this gal is going to be the next Sheryl, Sheryl Sandberg, then we may not, we might be able to like keep supply like really fixed because we have really good screening technology. My, my, my guess is that we don't have great screening technology because Mark Zuckerberg had to drop out of Harvard to like start his company. Same thing with Bill Gates, right? <laughs> um, if, if Harvard knew that Mark Zuckerberg was going to do what he was going to do, then I don't know that we would have let him like just well, I shouldn't speak for Harvard. But anyway, the, the point is, but in the absence of having really great screening technology, if you want to sample the tails of the distribution, you actually would want to increase supply because you don't know who is going to be the next genius. And so what you'd want to do is you'd want to admit like a ton of people because if that one guy or gal like makes it and, and turns it into like a billion dollar company, then they're going to cut like a check like Michael Bloomberg for like one billion dollars to Hopkins. And so you actually want to increase supply like a ton to be able to sample a lot from the tails of that productivity distribution. So that would potentially cut in the opposite direction. All right. OK. So let me talk you through this base model. So this was like a huge windup, because typically like, there are lots of ideas for why we think supply may not be increasing. So in this base model, this is going to be incredibly stylized. It's going to look almost like early action, where each student is going to apply to exactly um, one school. Students are going to differ in terms of their willingness to pay. So this gets to the, to the welfare question. And we're going to order these students from low to high. And we're going to use that to formulate like our inverse demand curve. And students are going to pay the sticker price. There's going to be no financial aid in the simple model. We're going to relax that assumption in the more general model when we get to it. And then we're going to consider N identical pair colleges. And those colleges are going to have utility over profits. And they're also going to have utility over prestige, which I'm going to explain what that looks like um, on the next slide. And they're just going to play a single stage, like one shot game to determine like, what the admissions rate is going to be and who are going to be admitted. We're going to relax all of these assumptions in the subsequent analysis. And in particular, we're going to allow schools to compete over like, the relative quality of the applicant pool. In case you think, well, I don't really like admissions rates. I prefer student quality. OK. Um, on this slide, we just argue why we use admissions rates instead of yield as a measure of, of, of prestige. One is that there are, a lot of, there are a lot of schools, whether they're religious schools or regional schools, that have really high yield. Like if you get into Utah State, you're definitely going to go or like Yeshiva or like any number of like local schools. The other thing, too, is when you look at newspapers, like just like admissions rates are searched for like by orders of magnitude larger than yield is going to be searched for. Um, even if you did a simple Google, if you pulled out your phone right now and typed in Stanford or Harvard, you would see this, right? The logo, Stanford is a private university, the acceptance rate. You don't even know what the tuition of Stanford is, but you know what the acceptance rate is. You don't even know what the tuition is of Harvard, but you know what the acceptance rate is, right? This is how salient this information is as a potential mark of quality. And so that's going to be another rationalization for why we use the admissions rate as being our measure of prestige, because it's publicly available, it's highly searched, and it's really easy to interpret and to like infer quality um, from that. All right. <laughs> and just one other like final jab. So when, when, when Stanford like overtook Harvard for being the most selective institution, like every year when the Crimson comes out, it's like for the fourth year in a row, Stanford beats Harvard's admissions rate, right? And this is Harvard being like very self-conscious about this fact. Like it's a very salient measure of, of quality. So let, let's write down the model. So university is going to have utility UI over profits. And so this is just your standard profit, just like this is your inverse demand. So like what's the price at that given quantity multiplied by the price minus the marginal cost times the quantity. And then this term here is going to be relative prestige. 
Now, let me explain this. The AI in here is going to be what's the admissions rate of college I. So 1 minus AI is going to be the rejection rate. And then this A minus I is going to be what's the average admissions rate of the peer institutions. So for example, if University I is Stanford, AI is going to be what's Stanford's admissions rate? That's going to be 5%. And A minus I is going to be what's the average admissions rate of its peer institutions? So Princeton, Yale, and, and Harvard, right? And the reason why we subtract one from this prestige term is if Stanford had the exact same admissions rate as its peers, then this first term here would just be one. And when we subtract one from one, we just get zero. So this is just like a centering. So if Stanford rejects more people than its peers, it's going to get some positive utility from being more prestigious than its peers. If Stanford rejects less folks than its peer institutions do, then Stanford is going to get, in a sense, like negative utility from the prestige because it's going to be perceived as being less uh, prestigious relative to its peers. And so this is what colleges are going to be choosing. They're going to be choosing the quantity of students to admit. And that's going to affect, so this quantity is going to appear in the admissions rate. It's also going to appear in the profit function too. So this is just a very like, simple way to encode that. Let me make one other point, and this is more about normalization. So set aside prestige for a moment. If universities were just pure monopolies, profit maximizing monopolies, then in a sense, we can think about what's the, so, what's the, what's the efficient level of output that the universities should produce. And that would be just setting price equal to marginal cost, right? That would give us what's the maximum social surplus that universities can generate. What we're going to do is we're going to decompose this weight that universities place on prestige. So remember this RI tells us, like, how much do universities care about prestige? We're going to say, we're going to decompose that into this prestige weight multiplied by the total social surplus that a monopoly would provide. So in a sense, we should be focusing on this row parameter, which is going to tell us like, how much do universities value prestige relative to the maximum social surplus that the university would generate, even if it were acting as a monopoly, that did not care about prestige. And a lot of our results are going to be thinking about how do we categorize universities with respect to this row, and how does their admissions behavior, how does their admissions behavior in the presence of increasing demand vary depending on how high row is relative to some threshold value. Let me just stop there to make sure that this, this part is clear. Are there any questions on this? Yeah. Yeah, this, this is a super important question. This is the first sort of question, which basically says, what is the objective function of the university? Like, what are universities maximizing? And our colleague who left, like, a baseline, he said it's prestige, right? So, um, and, and the other part of your question, too, has to do with this notion of universities offering slots at a, at, a, at a loss, right? So we have a part of the paper where we compute the marginal cost, right? And the marginal cost is very different from the fixed cost. And oftentimes when people think about like what's the cost of a student, they're thinking about the average cost, right? Which is going to include like the cost of maintaining the buildings, which is going to include the cost of faculty salaries. And, 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 and the reality, especially at a research institution, is that most fa like a lot of faculty time is actually devoted to research. And so those calculations don't take into account the fact that when they lump in faculty salaries, they're not decomposing that into like how much of it is research versus how much of it is going to be teaching. And so when we do our marginal cost um, calculations, like we take all of that into consideration. And it turns out that most colleges, the marginal cost is lower than the sticker price, right? Now, if you take into account the total like fixed cost, like that might be a different story. But in the context of thinking about like how firms are making decisions, fixed costs are just taken as like sunk costs, right? These buildings were built like many years ago, right? You have to maintain them if nobody's in this lecture hall, if everybody's in this lecture hall. So that's one point of confusion. Now on to the question that you asked, which is, you know, did we just think about this because we think uh, that universities are indeed maximizing, um, are indeed maximizing profits? 
So you can, think about, you can think about universities as maximizing revenue if you don't like the idea of universities in terms of maximizing profits. Or you can think about the fact that there are certain parts of the university that are, for example, professional schools certainly are profit centers, like lots of programs that offer mac that master's degrees. And so in a sense, like, this money can flow to other parts of, of the university. So we do think that there is some aspect of that going on. Uh, the, the second piece, too, is that the prestige component, although we don't provide, although this is kind of a black box, the university might care about the prestige exactly because being more prestigious could allow it to attract more resources, right? And so think about this as like a, a stylized way of capturing like some of the trade-offs, right? This may not be the exact, this may not be the exact model of what the universities are maximizing, but we think that it's a decent representation of like the fundamental trade-offs that are that are happening within this context. All right. So <clears throat> let me make one other comment. So because university utility is going to depend on the, uh, the admissions rate of its peers, this is something that the university cannot control, right? And so in a sense, when Stanford makes its decision about the admissions rate, that's going to affect the utility that Harvard gets from its prestige. Remember that headline that we had, like for the fourth year in a row, Stanford beats Harvard? Stanford can only beat Harvard because Stanford's admissions rate is lower than Harvard, and Harvard cares about that. Those two things have to necessarily be important. And so effectively, like what, school, what schools are doing is they're playing this game here. So when we solve for the first order conditions here, like Stanford's choice of an admissions rate is going to affect like Harvard's prestige, the, the component of Harvard that, that deals with prestige. So we have a game here. And when we solve that game, the, the Nash equilibrium of that game is going to be this vector of admissions rates. A1 is going to be the admissions rate for a school one, all the way up to N, which are going to be all of the schools in a given pair group. This is going to be an equilibrium if each college is maximizing its utility, given under the assumption that it's a best response to what the choices of its peers uh, are doing. Right? And so in a sense, like, that's going to be the condition under which this is an equilibrium. And then we're going to assume that the colleges are homogeneous in this context. And so like, all of the colleges are going to place the same weight on prestige. They're going to have the same inverse demand function. And the equilibria are going to be symmetric as well, too, meaning that the admissions rates are going to be equal. This is just for illustrative purposes. Did you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Because like, yeah. The I, rates at the margins here too, like 5.4.8 versus 5.3, like it seems like you're yeah. assuming that the decision is made when they get their application. So what's happening is, so the university is going to be choosing the quantity of students yeah. to admit, not the admissions rate directly. We have a very simplified, so in a sense that's the supply side of this equation, right? The demand side really has to do with how are students choosing to apply. And in this context, we're going to assume that every student that has a non-zero willingness to pay are, is going to apply. And you can think about like, that as like, getting the requisite recommendations, being able to pay the, um, the application fee, and so on and so forth. And so the demand side here is going to be incredibly simplified. What you say is exactly right, and that's one of the reasons why we do an extended model where we will have three stages, where students choose where to apply, colleges choose who to admit, and then in the third stage, students choose whether to matriculate conditional on getting an acceptance. And that's going to be a lot richer, that extended model. Think about this very simplified model as really trying to get at the essence of what's this fundamental trade-off between maximizing some financial return against maximizing some prestige. And then this is a very like, simplified, like, stylized way to, to represent this. Um, Einstein has this famous quote where he's like, every model is wrong. Right? The model is just supposed to be like a very simplified way of representing um, reality. And our hope is that it's capturing those trade-offs. But to make more specific like, comments about the welfare, we're going to have like, that three-stage model that takes the, the structure of what an actual admissions process looks like. All right, great. All right, so we have 35 minutes. We're good on time. OK. And <clears throat> so let's define a bar to be 
the admissions rate that maximizes the college utility in the presence of the college not caring about prestige when the weight on prestige is zero. And so effectively, that's going to be what's the admissions rate if the college were acting as a monopoly. What we can show is that if colleges were acting collusively to maximize the sum of total utility over all colleges, they would actually set their admissions rate equal to this monopoly quantity here. Right? So if they were acting collusively, they would internal Stanford would internalize the fact that if its admissions rate were low, that's going to give Harvard like a prestige hit. And Harvard would internalize that that would happen for Stanford as well. And since they would be jointly maximizing utility, they would actually set the admissions rate to be equal to the monopoly quantity. Right? <clears throat> but in the context where there's a weight on prestige that's greater than zero, and colleges are each acting individually and not collusively, what we show in the paper is that the equilibrium admissions rate is going to be A star, which is going to be lower than the monopoly quantity. And so in a sense, colleges that have some weight on prestige are actually going to admit even fewer students than they would admit if they were only acting as monopolies, right? And this is because colleges are internalizing the fact that when they admit someone, that's also going to be raising their admissions rate, which is going to make them have a lower, have, have like less prestige given that they have a higher admissions rate relative to their peers. And so kind of intuitively these schools are playing this prisoner's dilemma game where I can't credibly commit to lowering my admissions rate if I don't know that my peers are going to credibly commit to doing that as well too. I think one of the, one of the most famous examples of this is in 2007, Harvard, UVA and Harvard, UVA and Princeton abolished their early action programs. And the thinking there was, what was that these programs advantage like kids who were coming from really like privileged backgrounds, right? Stanford did not, Yale did not. And four years later, Harvard reversed that decision, right? And it was exactly during this time too that Stanford leapfrogged Harvard as having the, the lowest admissions rate. And Harvard has not been able to reclaim that crown since then too, right? And so this is kind of like an illustrative case of like universities really caring about this. Um, question. Yeah, so, you, so some universities actively manipulate that. So there have been some universities that have, ad, that have taken away like essay requirements that have made the application process simplified. Technology like the Common App has made it a lot cheaper for folks to apply. There are some universities that will actively um, send out mailers to students who they know will not qualify for being there. So there's, there's active manipulation on that margin. Another thing too that you see is the size of waitlist at colleges are huge, right? If you look at the University of Pennsylvania, I'm familiar with, 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 with the data from Penn, the, wait, the size of the waitlist is almost as big as the size of the incoming class. The size of waitlist is around like 2,000 or something like that, right? And so there are tons of margins that, that schools are, are, are adjusting on. And in some sense, you can take that as further evidence that schools really care a lot about being able to calibrate their admissions rate and also to calibrate to some extent their yield as well too, right? And so schools are behaving strategically. And a big part of the point of this paper is that the size of a college is actually an intentional choice. It's not just something that we take as, as being fixed. Ben, you have a question. So I, I work here in the President Miller's office as well as the admissions committee and just run into a lot of the conversations about instituting a leadership around the yeah. admissions rates as well as what the changes are going to be. Stanford, or I, I don't know about the other universities on the list, but Stanford specifically has a capped head count uh, because of their general use part that they need to submit to the county yeah. as on a regular rolling basis. They, they want to increase it, but they can't. And a lot of that is because of the environmental impact, uh, the cost of housing. Yeah, so like we don't, so, so the, the Stanford piece, like I recently became aware of that and you're absolutely right. So in a sense, like there are some regulatory constraints that are, that are placed on Stanford in particular in terms of, in terms of the size. Now, 
there's some cost to relaxing those constraints, right? Because like we all encounter regulation, right? And so then the question is like, are the benefits from like overcoming that regulation like outweighed by the cost of that regulation too, right? So um, that's one piece. In terms of the endowment, we don't directly look at the endowments in this paper, but you can think about the rankings based on the uh, selectivity of the colleges, the SAT um, scores of the college, as being like correlated with the endowments. And so in a sense, one of the takeaway messages from that, I wouldn't be surprised if what you find is that there are some large publics that have really large endowments, so I would expect that those would have increased a lot over time. But for the privates that have like really large endowments, you'd see like a very similar pattern. We see that for liberal arts colleges, they've not expanded a lot as well too. Sean, you had a question. Yeah, I'm, I completely agree. In fact, the, the quote, we have a quote in the paper from John around like circa 2007, where one of the things that he says in this article is he said one of, most, one of the most difficult conversations that he has with, with parents of like really qualified students is why their kid didn't get into Stanford. And he, and he says in the article, like, if we kept the line at like a 700 on the math and on the verbal, like Stanford would be, you know, like two to three times larger than it was, than it, than it currently is, right? And so in a sense, like, the desire to do these sorts of things. Dartmouth too like had a similar proposal that was on the table as well. So the desire to do that, but then the inability to actually like implement that across the board to like reflect some of these like broader realities in terms of like in the Dartmouth case, I believe it was there was a huge backlash from the alumni in terms of like expanding the size of the school, right? Thinking about like well what does that mean for, for, for this specific credential? And so we don't the way that we think about this work is saying that prestige is is, is is one component of what's going on and it seems to be a particularly salient component when we look at this inverse correlation between how much schools have expanded relative to like the demand. Like across the board there's been an increase in demand. But the schools that have expanded the slowest have been the schools that are the most elite and also the schools that have the most resources as well too. And that's something that this paper is saying all schools like face like a certain like regulatory and like thinking about their environmental impact and I in a given area they face like other types of like constraints and so what explains kind of this pattern that seems pretty robust like across the quality distribution in terms of like how selective the schools are and that's what we're really trying to highlight because Berkeley has expanded tremendously and, and in the UC system not only has Berkeley expanded but like you've had, you have UC Merced and like a lot of the other, this is kind of like an extensive margin expansion too where you actually have like new physical campuses, right? And so you may not need to expand the footprint of an existing campus, but maybe you can make like another campus or something like that. But, but these decisions have not been taken up by the, the very most elite institutions. And this is also against a backdrop of like a lot of other facilities popping up on elite campuses. Like at Harvard, we are building a new biomedical sciences facility next to the Harvard Business School. And that's a multi-billion dollar investment of like infrastructure, land, all of these other things too. Okay. So the, the key, so I showed you the equilibrium. The key comparator static is if schools care a lot about, about prestige, for an increase in demand for those schools, I can outward shift in the demand curve. If the schools care more about prestige than this threshold value, then what's going to happen is those schools are going to reduce the admissions rate in the presence of this increased demand. If schools care less about prestige and this threshold value, they're going to decrease the admissions rates. And this is basically seeing that this is like a cutoff point for like the schools that are the elite schools that have not been expanding that much. 
versus the, the non-elite schools that have been expanding a lot more. And so like this very, this very stylized model is able to replicate a pattern that we see in, in the data. Now let, let me talk about some of the welfare consequences, which goes to a question that was asked earlier. So we're going to define the prestige debt weight loss as the loss in the social surplus that's generated by a monopoly college with prestige. Right? And so in a sense, like the benchmark is going to be like a perfectly competitive firm that sets price equal to marginal cost. A monopoly is going to set price equal, marginal revenue equals to marginal cost. And so it's going to produce a lower quantity. Whereas an institution that cares about prestige is going to set marginal revenue equal to marginal cost plus marginal prestige. So in a sense, like the cost of expanding is not just the marginal cost, but it's also the marginal decrement in the prestige that you experience when you're, when you're larger because now you're less selective relative to your peers. And so to see that in figures, this is our inverse demand curve here. This is the marginal revenue curve here. This is marginal cost. A perfectly competitive firm would set price equal to marginal cost and would produce this quantity of students. A monopoly would set marginal revenue equal to marginal cost and produce this much students. And this is like your standard like dead weight loss, um, standard dead weight loss, like Harburger triangle. Now, a a university that cares about prestige and profits is going to set marginal revenue equal to marginal cost plus marginal prestige and is going to actually produce here. And so this shaded region here, we're going to call this the prestige dead weight loss. Right? So that's like the reduction in quantity and also the increase in price that comes from schools having this consideration over prestige. And what we can show is that under a very general set of circumstances, as the, if the admissions rate is lower than some threshold value, that's a function of the monopoly quantity, then the prestige dead weight loss, the shaded area, is actually going to be larger than the standard dead weight loss, right? which is our typical like, measure of welfare. So just to put numbers on that, like imagine if the marginal cost was zero and the monopoly admissions rate were 50%, then a college's prestige dead weight loss would be larger than the standard dead weight loss if the observed admissions rate were lower than like 30%. And as you get closer and closer to zero, like the prestige dead weight loss becomes larger and larger in absolute terms and even in relative terms relative to the standard dead weight loss. Okay. And we have a couple of other like modifications where we think about um, a dynamic model in which prestige changes over time. And we look at a, a context in which schools um, are competing in like a corno fashion where like one individual school is not price setting. We also can relax the assumption of schools being identical and we look at what happens when the schools are heterogeneous and those results are in the paper. I want to go on to the enhanced model relative to the question that was asked and, and the reason for us doing this is to capture the knock-on effect that Sean mentioned, right? So in a sense, if students, if schools become a lot more selective and the, the probability of getting in decreases, then students may want to apply to more schools. Right? And so we want to enrich the demand side a lot more in that. So that's one of the reasons why we're going to do that. And then also to, we want to really capture like all stages of the admissions process. So in the first stage, students are going to choose which college to apply to. In the second stage, colleges are going to choose which students to admit and also how much financial aid to award. And in the third stage, admitted students are going to choose whether they attend or not. So this is the yield. And what's going to be running in the foreground of this model is going to be we're going to assume that students have a certain like ability type that's going to be drawn from some distribution that follows the, form, the following PDF, gamma of theta. And also theta is going to be bounded on this interval here. So when we calibrate the model, we're going to calibrate it using um, the distribution of SAT scores. Okay. There's going to be like a lot of notation here. I'm going to just talk about it from a really high level in terms of what's happening. So if you don't read Greek, don't worry about that. You're not going to be lost. Like this literally is Greek. <laughs> so in the first stage, students are going to be choosing where to apply. This is going to be the expected benefits of applying. And so this is going to be like, what's the return to going to that school for a student of a given ability theta? This eta of theta is going to be what's the probability that they apply. And then this term here is going to be, what's the probability that they get in, conditional on applying? And then this term is going to be, what's the likelihood that they go, conditional on, on applying, right? And then this last term here is going to be, what's the likelihood that they get rejected from all of the other schools? So in a sense, like the value of applying to Stanford is going to be a lot higher if you expect to be rejected from like all of the other schools to which you applied, right? And so that's what this piece here is going to capture. And so in a sense, this is going to be the application decision. 
And what's going to happen is you're going to choose to apply if the benefit of applying exceeds the cost of applying at all ability levels. So that's just the headline from this, from this first stage. Okay. Now, what we're going to do is in the second stage is colleges are going to be thinking about who to admit. And we're going to enrich the model in the following way. We're going to allow for colleges to care about the prestige that was shaped by the admissions rate. But then there's also a lot of important work that shows that what matters is the student quality. So uh, Professor Hawksby, who's here at Stanford, like, has some amazing work that shows over time that selective schools have gotten like a lot more, elite schools have gotten a lot more selective in terms of admitting students with higher SAT scores, whereas non-elite schools have actually become a lot less selective over time. And so if instead what in universities cared about was what's the skill level of my matriculating um, body of students relative to my peers, then that's going to be captured by this term. And then this term is going to be what the, profit, what the profits term is. One way to think about this is this piece here is going to be like, what's the willingness to pay of a student of type theta? And we're going to integrate that across the whole distribution. And so effectively, schools are going to be charging like students exactly how much they're willing to pay. And so this is going to be like first degree price discrimination in which schools can accurately read how much you're willing to pay. So think about it as the school gives you a FAFSA, you fill it out, and they're like, this is your demonstrated need. And so therefore, we're going to charge you X to do that. So financially, it is going to be baked into the way that this model is set up. All right. And this is just showing you like functionally like how the admissions rate is going to depend on um, how many students have that given ability, what's the likelihood that you apply, what's the likelihood that you get in, right? Divided by the total number of students that apply, right? So that's, that's what this Greek is. Okay. And the last step is going to be the yield, which is going to be basically what's the likelihood that you come given that you have gotten in. And in this context, again, we're going to be thinking about we're going to be thinking about identical colleges. And so the way to think about this is, in this denominator, this is the expected number of schools that you got into. So like the yield for like a given school only matters conditional on you getting into that school. So this one is you got into the school, and this other piece is that you applied to some other schools, not that school, and that you got into those schools too. So in the denominator is an expectation, how many schools do I, have I gotten into? And so one over that is just going to be me like randomizing between these schools. Um, that I've gotten into. And then this is going to be predicated on the assumption of the schools um, being identical, which we can relax as well too, but for the, for the sake of simplicity, I'll present it this way. Um, and what we do is we can solve this model. We, can so we solve this model computationally um, going through each of the, the three stages. The exact um, way in which we solve it is outlined in the paper. I'm just going to skip over this for the sake of time, because I've shown you enough Greek, but if you're interested, like dig into the paper and we can talk a bit more about that. And let me talk you through some of the, some of the simulation, like evidence and also the calibration. So we're going to take that the ability distribution is just going to follow the normal distribution, where we're just going to be using the, where we're just going to be using like the mean and the standard deviation of the SAT. And then the second thing that we're going to do is remember this lambda is going to be What's the, what's the likelihood of you being rejected from the school as a function of your ability? And we're going to parameterize this with, with alpha i, which you can think of as like a shape parameter. And the headline from this is like, there's going to be some minimum level, like even folks with the maximum level of skill, like a 1600 in the SAT, they're not going to be admitted with probability one, right? So if you have, <clears throat> if for example, like you have the, the maximum um, SAT score, then what's going to happen is your theta is going to be theta max, and we get theta max minus theta min over that. This whole term here is going to be, this whole term here is going to be zero to the alpha, which is just going to be one, and then your your likelihood of being rejected is going to be lambda min, right? Okay. And so effectively, what schools are going to be choosing is schools are going to be choosing this like alpha i, which is going to which is going to fully specify what the rejection function is of that of that school. Okay. Uh, the other headline here is that it turns out that having both preferences over like the relative admissions rate and also the the relative skill, like those two things are going to be those two things are, that's going to be over identified. And so in a sense we can only have one of those in the model. And what we're going to choose to do is only have like the, the preferences over the relative skill in the model, because we've already shown you in the simplified model like what happens when schools have preferences over the admissions rate. 
And the other feature of it is, is that we're going to be able to tell you, like, once we calibrate the model, how does the skill of applicants respond to like the prestige versus their not being prestige too? So that's going to be one of the big features of the, of, of the calibration exercise. I'm going to show you some figures that look at our calibrations, and then I'm going to I'm going to go through those like in, in detail. But I just want to stop here for a second and see if there are any questions so far. No, I've shown you enough Greek. <laughs> okay, so what we're going to do is. We're going to calibrate the model so that we can perfectly fit what the admissions rate is. And so in a sense, one way to think about that is we're going to say, like, what parameters, what weight on prestige, and what willingness to pay in all of these other parameters are we going to need in order to perfectly match the admissions rate? Because what we want to get at in this extended model is really trying to understand the application behavior, which is not observed, right? And so we're going we're to fit everything to perfectly match the admissions rate and then also to match... Um, the number of matriculants, and then what we're going to do is we're going to say, now let's look at the things that we did not match on and see like how well we're able to predict those relative to the actual observed patterns in the data. Okay, so we're perfectly going to be able to match, um, perfectly able to match the admissions rate, and if we were to set prestige equal to zero, what we would find is the admissions rate would be like a half. It would be like pretty high. Now, when we come to the matriculates, we're also going to calibrate. We're also going to match on the number of matriculants, so we're going to perfectly match that. On average, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and Stanford are going to have like around like 220, 2,200 students. But in the absence of prestige, like they would have had like a whole lot more students. So that's one of the things that we get from the simulation. But then again, too, like we're matching exactly on this. Now, something that we don't match on is like what's the mean skill of the matriculants? The matriculates, that's something that we don't match on. And in this, in this solid line, this is going to be what we would predict from our model where we have uh, schools caring about prestige. And in this dotted line, what we're going to see is the actual data. Right? And what we can see is that the model with prestige is going to match this overall increase in the mean skill of the kids that are matriculating to these elite schools. But if we turn off prestige in the model, like we're not gonna, we're, what we're going to find is this very flat profile in terms of like what the mean skill of applicants are going to look like. And so in a sense, the model is helping us to rationalize the increase in the skill that we're seeing of the students who are going to elite institutions. Now, when we look at the mean number of applicants, and so this goes back to the question this goes back to the question that you were raising, Sean, and we did not match on the mean number of applicants, right? We, we calibrated the data to exactly match the mean number of like, folks who are, who are admitted. What we're going to find, so these, these, um, dark, these dark diamonds here are going to represent the actual data. So in our model with prestige, we're going to be able to predict what looks very similar to the data. But in the model without prestige, what you would have seen is that in the absence of prestige, there's actually going to be like, a lot more people applying. Right? And this may actually seem kind of counterintuitive. So, let me break this down. They're kind of like two margins, right? You can think about the number of, of people applying to schools as being, for a given applicant, how, ma how many people are applying to any school multiplied by, on average, like how many schools a given person is applying to. So those are kind of like the two margins along which one can adjust. And what's going to be happening here is that when you look at the average skill of the applicants, this is something that we don't observe. But because we have this model, we can actually like, predict from the model like, what the pattern in the average skill of applicants is going to look like. When schools have some weight on prestige, over time, the average skill of the applicants is, are going to increase. And so what that's going to mean is that, in a sense, these schools are going to become a lot more competitive to get into. And so if you know as a student that you're competing against folks who on average have like a higher skill than you do, and moreover that skill is increasing over time, that affects the likelihood that you actually want to apply to those schools because you think, I can't get into that school, so why should I apply to that school? And so that explains why in this model with prestige you actually see less people applying relative to the model without prestige. Questions? Yeah, so like what we, that spike is really coming from like a change in the marginal cost, from the marginal cost that we estimate in the model. 
So like around this time, we see like the marginal cost of these schools are going up a lot. And we need to investigate a bit more like why that's happening. So the way that we calculate marginal cost in, in the paper, and let me just keep an eye on time. Okay, I have 10 minutes, is... You don't have to get into detail. Okay, yeah, yeah. But, it's, but, it, but what's happening is like the change in, in the marginal cost. Okay. Yeah, so that's what's driving that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right, so, so in a sense, what's happening is the model with, with prestige is going to explain the data a lot better in terms of the number of applicants. And the reason why is because in the absence, in, in, in the presence of prestige, the mean skill of the applicants increases a lot. And so the folks who are willing to pay that price to apply is actually a lot lower. So you get this kind of a, a counterintuitive result there. And one of the, one of the, the kind of like smoking guns for this is if, if you look at where students are applying given what their preferences are and how that's changing over time. So on the horizontal axis, we have the year. And on the vertical axis, we have the average SAT scores of the students. And in red is going to be like the average SAT scores, the time series of the average SAT scores of people who got into their first choice. And in this yellow is going to be folks who got into their fourth choice or, or below. And what you see is initially in the, in the early 1980s, like the kids who got into their first choice and their second choice had around the same SAT scores. But over time, what you see is that the kids who got into their first choice have lower SAT scores than the kids who got into their fourth choice. And so how do we think about this? This is reflecting like very strategic behavior, right? The kids who are aiming a lot higher are the kids who have like higher SAT scores, but they're actually getting into worse schools. And so this is consistent with this idea that at the very elite schools, what's happening is that the main skill of applicants is increasing a lot. And so in a sense, like those kids who are applying to those schools are less likely to get into like less likely to get into their top choice and they're actually falling to their fourth choice or something like that. And so this is some indirect evidence of this is some indirect evidence of strategic application behavior, which is consistent with some of the findings of the model that over time, like the mean skill of applicants is increasing over time. And what that's led to is like a, a lower likelihood of people like wanting to compete um, for, for those schools. Um, this here just, we look at the mean skill of the applicants versus the matriculates. So what you can see is um, this is putting those two graphs together. So both of them are increasing over time, but as expected, like those who matriculate are going to have higher scores than the applicants because they were the ones that actually passed that screening process. Now when we look at the, so what, we, what we've seen so far is that the number of applicants when we look at a model with prestige is actually going to be a lot lower than when we look at a model without prestige. But if we look at the number of applicants per slot, what we actually see is that in the data, the model with prestige is going to predict a lot more like the competition at the level of an individual slot, right? But in the model without prestige, even though we saw that there were going to be many more applicants, we also saw that there were going to be many more slots as well too. Because in the model without prestige, universities are going to be expanding supply in response to this increase in demand. Whereas in the model with prestige, universities are not going to be expanding supply to increase with demand. So even though in the model with prestige, we saw that they're going to be like less applicants, the number of applicants per slot is actually going to be a lot higher, right? And so this is the kind of competition, that Hunger Games competition that we see being satirized in the New York Times, et cetera. And the model with prestige is really going to follow the data pretty carefully, even though we did not calibrate um, to this particular moment of the data. Sean. There should be some. Can you can you say your question again for me, Sean? Yeah. Can you explain the entire phenomenon? So I say over time, more people that wanted to go to college, mm -hmm. so more people apply. There's a lag in the time for the colleges to respond to the student capacity, and so in the short run, admission rates have to go down because there's more applicants. Feedback loop. Even if they want to respond, they can't do it fast enough. That creates a feedback loop. The 
Yeah, that's that's right. And so that would be operative for the that would be operative for the case without prestige. So if you look at the um, so you're saying that if we were to put in place like a time to build assumption, what would happen is in a sense because the colleges aren't able to respond. You're so so in that context, like if if you imagine that folks were forward looking, right? Like they knew that at some point the college the college was going to expand, right? Then maybe what they would do is like take a gap year. Right? And they say, it's not going to expand this year. There's going to be some lumpiness in the quantity. And I'm going to take a gap here, like gamble on that. Right? You'd expect to see some, some version of that where like, the application behavior would look a lot lumpier. Right? So that would be, I mean, like, that, would, that would be my, that would be, in my sense, in, in my estimation, that would be the smoking gun of that. Because if this process were happening for like 50 no, years. If everyone thought that way, it wouldn't increase their odds at all. Like, I don't You'd see, you'd see swings. I think under that, you would see swings in the number of people applying, right? Because you'd, you'd, you'd say. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how it's playing out. I'm just curious whether the fact that you assume the model can has sort of immediate elasticity or capacity in the most obtuse model. Yeah. I, Um, we can we can invest we can investigate that further. So like let's see let's look at the number of matriculants. So like in the no prestige context, right? So you see in the in the early 1990s, like there's almost like no increase here, right? So there's a lot of dynamics in here that seems to suggest that the time to build assumption isn't exactly what's driving it, but it's really like the underlying, in a sense, like supply and demand dynamics that's driving it. But we could consider we could consider putting in some kind of like time to build assumption. And then think about the extent to which like agents are going to be forward looking to see if that would change some dynamics. That's something that we haven't done, but we could do that. That's a fair point. That's a fair point. Okay, I have like two minutes. Okay. <laughs> Let me um, I'm super close to being okay. So remember that prestige dead weight loss that we the prestige dead weight loss that we mentioned, which was so this figure is just gonna plot what's the prestige dead weight loss relative to the social surplus. And that's kind of like our benchmark. And what we can see is over time it increases dramatically from about like, a, like almost unity in the 1990s to almost like a multiple of seven times, right? So remember that comparative static that, that I showed you where as the admissions rate spirals down below like some threshold value, you actually start to see the prestige dead weight loss being a lot larger than, than, the, than the typical standard dead weight loss. In the last 90 seconds, let me conclude. Uh, so we write down a model in which um, colleges have preferences over, over uh, prestige or relative selectivity. And what we, show is, what we show theoretically is that when colleges have a greater weight on prestige uh, above some threshold value, that in the presence of increasing demand, those colleges are going to be the ones that are going to reduce their admissions rates and invariably not going to expand quantity as quickly. Whereas the colleges that place a weight on prestige above some threshold value, those are going to be the colleges that are going to expand, right? And so this is hearkening back to that opening figure where we saw like demand increasing across the quality spectrum, but at the very elite schools they were not expanding, but at the very non-elite schools they were the ones that were expanding in the face of this like common demand shock, right? So that's like the first point. And the second, the second thing that we show too is that this consideration over relative prestige is going to introduce a new type of dead weight loss, which in the context of this paper, we term the prestige dead weight loss. And this comes from, from universities setting uh, marginal revenue equal to marginal cost plus marginal prestige. And it's going to turn out that that dead weight loss from caring about prestige is going to be even larger than the, than the standard dead weight loss too. And so that's kind of like putting this into context um, with how much, are we, how much are we leaving on the table. And the, the fourth and the final point is that this is a context in which collusion could be, or coordination, let's use that word instead, coordination could potentially um, be socially beneficial, right? Because if schools could credibly commit to expanding, they don't compromise 
um, they don't compromise their prestige, and you can keep the ordering of schools being the same, but in terms of the absolute number of students that the schools are admitting, that could actually increase too. And so from a regulatory standpoint, we should think about the extent to which we want um, to pursue antitrust cases in, in, in this context, right, if schools are coordinating. And so there, there are lots of gains to be placed on the table. And what we'd like you to take away from this paper is that in a lot of the, the literature, there's been a ton of focus on the demand side within higher education. Students' preferences over schools, preferences over locations, how likely are they to move to go to a better school. There's been a lot less focus on the supply side. And oftentimes in models, we take the supply of slots at colleges as being, as being fixed. And, and this paper is a step towards endogenizing the supply decision of colleges and saying what are some things that colleges might care about. And one of the motivating features for why we think prestige could play a role among other factors is when we look at the profile of which colleges have expanded, it's really been the less elite colleges, whereas the most elite colleges are the ones that have not expanded, right? And when we look at the resources in terms of teachers, when we look at the quality of students that are applying there, when we look at the resources in terms of land and other things, and even when we look at the historical record of Harvard and Yale fighting over which school was going to be the largest in the early 1900s, or if we look at the fact that these schools prior to the modern rankings era were increasing by like 40 and 80%, these, these, all of these features seem to be inconsistent with the idea that um, elite schools are incapable of expanding. This is more of a choice, and we think that prestige, we, we've shown that prestige could potentially explain some of the reasons why these schools have not expanded. Um, I want to thank you for a really wonderful day of, of conversations. Um, I know that I'm at my time limit, but if you have other questions, I'm fine to take those questions um, offline like afterwards. So thank you very much. So why don't we just then continue the conversation over here? That sounds awesome. That sounds great. Yeah.